When I was three years old, I destroyed government property. Some would blame my parents, and they would be right. The months before had been marked with nightmares. Same nightmare every night. Waking up screaming. It was always the same. I was being chased. They were small, they were gray, they were coming after me, surrounding me. So at the end of a nightmare, I woke up screaming. They were all around me. They were intelligent, tracking my every movement. But now I was standing there in my room, and I had a screwdriver in my hand. It was laying there, one of them, right in front of me, small, gray, pale. I took the screwdriver, and with the poor motoric skill of a three-year-old, I put it in the middle, gave it a twist, and it came apart. I had a look in it, and instead of seeing the gremlins inside, but I had feared, and all the things that sort of scared me, so some plastic, some wires, and some mechanical components, but no gremlins. And I felt my fear of these things wash away. So my encounter with the Alan Erickson dialogue telephone, <laughs> my curiosity of finding out what was inside, really made me dismantle the fear at only three years old age. It might be helpful to know that in the 70s, the government state-owned corporation Televerket actually owned the telephones, but you got to borrow the telephone when you subscribed, so hence the government property, in case you wondered. I have created mornings to thank for my newfound interest and curiosity that has been hidden in plain sight for me for a long time. And almost a year ago, Tash Wilcox uh, had a great talk about making friends, not connections. At the end of her presentation, she asked the audience to tweet their favorite Swedish words, and she would illustrate them. Without thinking too much, I just dialed in nybörjare and nyfiken. So this is what came back. And nyfiken is the Swedish word for curiosity, but I like the Swedish word a bit more. Uh, because how it's constructed, both the sound, nyfiken, kind of nice ring to it. It's soft and really nice, but it consists of ny, which is new, and fiken, which is eager to learn something. So the construction is eager to learn something new. And I, I really like that. So I've been thinking about and doing research for almost a year on curiosity. And I want to share some of the insights and some stories related to that. And one good point to start is really, what would the world look without curiosity? So imagine a world without curiosity. It would be rather pale, kind of bleak. But I find that it would be even worse. Dark, horrible, in the same way that poor use of Photoshop filters only can illustrate. <laughs> Right. So, but it would be a dangerous place. It would be a place, a place without curiosity or a world without it. You would be told what is right and wrong. It's against or for. There is no science, there is no progress, there is no creativity. So curiosity is a lot of, in a way, in a lot of things that are really important to us. But despite being sort of slightly depressive and not a good world, I also find that it reminds me of a place in Oregon uh, <laughs> with a population of 8,000. They have a fantastic motto, uh, and that is the most fantastic place to live. So, go boring, or, well, whatever. <laughs> uh, Christer Hedberg, one of the co-founders of Creative Mornings Gaffenberg, in a couple of weeks ago, he had this great inspirational letter, and he included a quote that I found very suitable for this talk by the brilliant Dorothy Parker. And she said that the cure for boredom is curiosity, and there is no cure for curiosity. The cure for boredom is curiosity, there is no cure for curiosity. Interesting. So let's move on from the three-year-old, move ahead 11 years to my early teens. This was 
obviously before beard <laughs> happened, but gravity kind of made something out of it. I was very bored at school. I didn't do great. My grains were really bad, with a few exceptions. I was bored out of my head. All the subjects just dreadful. But two superheroes showed up in, in, in the shape of teachers. And they handed me the key to curiosity. And it was literally a key. It was a key to the music room, so I could go and practice percussion. So one of the things that I did well in was music, the other technology. But also the key to the computer room, so I could learn how to program. So they saw the spark in my eye, they facilitated my curiosity. And that really made me survive school at all. My path later on would take a very strange route. I didn't go to university. Well, I did. I uh, flunked a course in Japanese, if that counts. Um, but I've been working as an electrical engineer, designing computers, writing software that 40% of all cats download as mobile devices pass through, if anyone thinks of that as interesting. Um, and yeah, I had a great technology career until I grew tired of technology and found that people made me even more curious. But thinking of education and the role of the teachers and the people that can facilitate curiosity, uh, I ran across another quote. Empathy and curiosity is just as important as multiplication. This sentence holds two of my favorite words and is not important and not multiplication. <laughs> the interesting thing is who said this, and that is the head of the OECD, PISA, so the organization that assesses educational systems. Um, and there has been a lot of debate about educational system and PISA results and whatnot. Very few times have I heard the words empathy and curiosity in those discussions, and I hope that that will change. So facilitating more curiosity in school. Moving ahead with a story. So ironically, I ended up working for the company manufacturing the strange phones that I was scared of. So some psychoanalogist uh, can certainly figure that out. So I worked about 50 years for Ericsson doing things. But a couple of years ago, I started my own business called Unicorn Salting. So it's only me, and it has a unicorn, so obviously it's great. Um, and I, I was thinking, how can I design my business for curiosity? I've seen a lot of examples of organizations that really, yeah, they fail on measuring, for example, innovation, innovation consultant, and um, thinking, what KPI or key performance indicator can I include? to really trigger curiosity. So my key performance indicator is how many times have I managed to surprise myself? Measure this quite often. Um, last year, I couldn't foresee that I would be standing here speaking about my passions, also playing you know, with the fantastic Eric Torstenson. Um, having this, so this, like, ah, that is curiosity. So I'm doing good according to my own metrics, which is basically what you have, right? I want to share a few things about innovation. So I work with people and innovation. And had made some connections between curiosity and innovation. One can see innovation as both the outcome and also the process. And right now I'm focusing on the process of how you work with innovation, not what the end result is. And one can see it that innovation is built on three pillars, innovation work, at least my interpretation of it from working for five, six years in the field. The first one is creativity. Which one? This one comes rather easily. So innovation, creativity, ah, that is. Um, I'm not particularly interested in creativity. Maybe strange to say that at creative mornings and stuff, but uh, like, well, yeah, creativity, yeah, whatever. Um, I find that it's interesting when it happens, but I don't overanalyze it. The second pillar is one of my favorite words, 
empathy. So in order to develop something new that is useful to somebody, you, you need to be curious and you need to sort of put yourself in someone else's shoes. So empathy is really a key part, especially coming from a design-oriented approach to innovation, but empathy is really key. And the last pillar is doing stuff. Innovation is not an academic exercise. It is doing, it is experimenting, it is putting things to market. And I was thinking like, well, creativity, really good, empathy, yeah, yeah. doing stuff, mm, yeah, it's fun. The basis is really curiosity. If you take curiosity away from these three, then it really falls apart. So there are some dangers to curiosity, though. So it's not always good. When I ask people about, so what does curiosity mean to you in preparation of this talk? They said, well, one gentleman stood out and said, well, curiosity is a will to power. I'm like, well, now that is kind of harsh. I'm like, yeah, it's a will to power. I'm like, been reading much German philosophers by any chance? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, so. And then I reflected on it that, well, if curiosity is a pursuit of knowledge, and knowledge is power, when logically, well, you can make the last step, right? Um, so curiosity as a will to power is kind of interesting. And I've found that curiosity challenges existing power structures quite often. They really, yeah, they... You can get really conflicting emotions when you're in a meeting in a boardroom and someone is making a bold statement and you ask, why? I'm like, ah, oh, don't say so, right? And um, so, of course, in some situations you discourage curiosity. And there are some famous tales and stories. And let's address the obvious one. So this is Elvis, my cat, that is upside down. So, and there is a famous story about something killed the cat, right? It is not so old, it is around 18, late 1800s. But in 1916, it was in an article in New York Post, which made the catchphrase, curious to kill the cat, catch on. Um, and it was a small cat named Blackie in New York, uh, and his owner, Miss Mabel. And one day, Blackie did what cats do, like, whoa, this is an interesting place. I think that I climbed up this fireplace and up the chimney. And uh, Miss Mabel asked the cat to come down, and the cat did what cats do, climbed even higher up, of course. And then, unfortunately, the cat climbed, Blackie climbed, uh, climbed all the way on top and fell down in another pipe, several stories. And Blackie could be here, heard screaming, so police, firefighters, ambulance, re rescue workers were called to the scene to try to get Blackie out from behind the wall. They opened a hole in the wall, and they found Blackie, but she had, she had injured her spine, so she passed away pretty quickly. Really sad story, but I think that curiosity has gone to blame for no reason. Instead, I would like to quote the not-so-well-known superhero, The Tick, that gravity is a harsh mistress. <laughs> it wasn't curiosity that killed the cat, it was gravity. It fell down. So the next time that someone said, says to you, well, curiosity killed the cat, well, so did gravity. <laughs> now you have a good comeback to that one, right? There are also some great benefits to curiosity. And um, I came across a fantastic lecture by a professor at Stanford called Robert Sapolsky. I don't generally suffer from beard envy, <laughs> but, but if I would, but if I did, I would, right? It's a great beard. But that is not what he's known for. He has a lecture called The Uniqueness of Humans. And in that lecture, he has a part where he talks about brain chemical called dopamine. And dopamine is part of a reward system. So some drugs work on the dopamine, on the reward system, like cocaine, euphorians, 
all of that info is in that talk, so I highly, if you're curious, go there afterwards and have a look at it. Uh, but there were some misconceptions about dopamine and the role that it played in the reward system. So thinking about dopamine level, you have sort of trigger for something, you have work and reward. What was commonly believed was that at the end, uh, that dopamine was released sort of as a reward. In the lecture and sort of after doing actual science and finding out, being curious about it, they found out this is not true. Dopamine is released in anticipation of reward. So you get this task to do, and like, yeah, you feel motivated. That is dopamine starting to surge and sort of preparing you for do something. And uh, without dopamine, you get clinically depressed. So it's really balanced also that it's really, you need motivation, you need this. What they also found was if you introduce a word maybe, then dopamine levels would spike. So something with an uncertain outcome would spike dopamine levels. And I find that this relates very well to curiosity, which is basically you go out and you look for things and you don't know the answers. So can you be addicted to curiosity? Well, maybe. If you're curious, I've, I urge you to find out. So do some research, be curious about it. I think that there are some indications of it, nonetheless. So starting to sort of, where is this going? Let's, I want to give you some practical tools for curiosity. So let's turn up the curiosity to, well, all the max, so 11 or whatever it is. <laughs> um, so why do that? First of all, curiosity increases the level of well-being. And that is correlated to lowering depression and anxiety. So curiosity is good for you in that way. Also, it will increase empathy and creativity. So thinking of innovation and sort of that work. And it will make the world a better place, more interesting place, if you allow curiosity to flourish. So I'm going to give you two tools. Uh, don't count the number of legs on the flamingos, so and you'll be fine, right? Uh, the first one is really simple. It's a question that you can ask yourself and others on a daily basis. And it's why. So start asking why more. So we're going to do this. Why? Uh, yeah, because, well, why? Simon Sinek, so, who wrote Always Start With Why, uh, probably would agree with me starting with why is a good thing, I imagine. So this is a very simple thing, but quite often it's overlooked. So starting with why. And then I have the second exercise, which is almost exactly twice as hard as asking yourself why. Um, and this requires, so I would, if you close your eyes, so close your eyes a bit and sort of lean backwards and think of something that really, you thought that, I'm not sure if I'm going to do this. Something is holding you back. It might be someone said, well, kill your darlings, but you really like that darling, so you want to do it, but it might be shame, it might be something that is holding you back. And um, if you open your eyes, and then you say to yourself, you look at all these reasons not to do something, and you ask yourself, why not? And also, it's not a question. Why not do that? I learned this in, at Burning Man <laughs> in 2013. This has been part also in preparing this talk, so trying to practice what I preach. So, got the question, well, do you and Eric want to play before so we, we start? Well, why not? So, am I really going to start my talk with one minute, one and a half minute introduction of Alsos Brachtsa Tustra, like, eh, why not? 
Am I really going to wear a business suit and unicorn slippers on stage in front of 300 people? <laughs> yeah, why not? So it takes you to unexpected places, and it really yeah, it helps you challenge yourself in a good way. So I usually th I love a way that in Spanish texts you sort of enclose a question with an upside-down question mark and a straight question mark. So now this sort of frames it in. So was this just a long question? I don't know. If you're curious, you might think of it and see if it is. But I don't want to leave you hanging around with a question. I want to leave you with something that you can take out of the day, get a new coffee, and I want you to rem remember three things. And the first one is, be curious. Are you writing this down? It might be. <laughs> Some are, yeah. No, that is good. Second one is be more curious. <laughs> are you seeing where this is heading, maybe? <laughs> like, curious error. And the third one, I would argue, is the most important one help others with one and two. So spread the curiosity, help others being curious. Thank you very much.